Peace on earth and mercy mild, God and sinners reconciled. Praise the Lord. Brother Woodward, it's so good to have you here at the New Life Church in Garland, Texas. Amen. Fredericton, New Brunswick, Canada. I guess, I guess you were born Canadian, is that right? Amen. Born Canadian. And I tell you, he's one of the most warm-hearted Canadians that I've ever met. Amen. And I met a few up there when I preached up in Canada. It was real cold. They were cold as the weather. Amen. But not this man. He's on fire. He's full of the Holy Ghost. He's very, very, very sensitive to the Holy Ghost. Moves in the Spirit. I told our, our leaders at the leadership retreat. I said, this man is God's gift to the United Pentecostal Church. He is God's gift. He preaches camp meeting conferences all over this world. And uh, he is with us. And what a privilege we are to have him at the New Life Church. Could you welcome him tonight? Amen. Brother Raymond Woodward. Praise the Lord, everybody. It's an honor and a privilege to be in the house of the Lord with all of you. And uh, I'm grateful for uh, your attendance at this special meeting tonight. And I'm also grateful for um, your faithfulness to the house of God, your worship. And uh, so thank you for being here. We're going to deal with a very important subject, and I want to get right into it because we do have a lot of ground to cover. We're going to go quite quickly. And uh, um, so I, I'll talk fast, <clears throat> and you can listen fast. How's that? Uh, but I do want the Lord to be here, and I have confidence that he's going to show up in the power of his spirit and kind of cement the word to our hearts. So if you would lift up your hands and lift up your voice one more time and Hallelujah. give the Lord permission to speak to you in this room. Tell Jesus you want him to speak to you. Lord Jesus, I give you praise and honor and glory. Thank you for this wonderful pastor and his dear wife. Thank you for the pastoral staff and the leaders that serve this church, and thank you for the saints of God. Now, Jesus, I pray that you would speak a word into our midst, and we give you all the praise in advance for it, because we ask it in Jesus' name. Everybody said amen. amen, and you may be seated. I don't know if you've ever thought about this before. I've thought about this. Many Christians today say that they serve a holy God. They say that their lives are governed by the Holy Bible. They say they want to spend eternity in a holy heaven. And some of them even say they're filled with the Holy Spirit. And yet in most of those churches, it's taboo to get up and say holiness. It scares them just about to death. Anybody who even dares to mention the subject of holiness, they think you're trying to be super spiritual. Or at least they think you're unfashionable or hypocritical or unreasonable or even pharisaical. They throw that word around. And the devil laughs at modern Christendom because one of his greatest deceptions continues to infect the lives of Christians around the world. It's like Isaiah said in chapter 5, good is called evil and light is called darkness and sweet is called bitter. And so holiness teaching, uh, in the words of Isaiah, he said, woe unto them that do that. The switch good for evil and, and light for darkness. And here's what he says in verse 21. Woe unto them that are wise in their own eyes and prudent in their own sight. We are the generation that fulfills that scripture. And holiness teaching today in many churches, even churches that call themselves Pentecostal, is called outdated and old-fashioned obsolete. And how in the world could that ever happen? Now, maybe a better question is, is this. Why does the devil... Fight the doctrine of holiness so much. Now, there's probably a thousand reasons. I'll give you three. I, I think in the words of, of Peter in his epistle, he says, But as he which has called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. Everybody say conversation. conversation. Now, in 2017, conversation means talk, talk, talk. But 400 years ago, when the King James Version was translated, Conversation meant more. It's not that the King James Version is inaccurate. It's that language has changed. And, and 400 and some years ago, when the King James was translated, 
Conversation meant more than talking. It meant every way in which you converse with the world around you, with people around you. And so the most accurate modern equivalent we would have for that word conversation today would be lifestyle. And here's what Peter's saying. As God which has called you is holy, you be holy in all manner of your lifestyle. Because it is written, be ye holy for I am holy. And the first reason I think the devil hates holiness so much is holiness, a lifestyle of holiness, is God's command for all of his people. It's not an option, it's a command. Now the good news about the commands of God is that if God gives you a command, there's power resident inside that command to help fulfill that command. Amen. Example, first chapter in your Bible, God says, let there be light. What happens next? And there was light. Because there's power in the command to help fulfill the command. Uh, go to the last book of your Bible, Revelation. If any man's thirsty, let him come. Let him drink of the water of life freely. If God says let him come, the devil better get out of the way. Because if you want to serve God, there's not a devil on earth that, that can hinder you if you've got a made up mind. So when God says, you be holy as I am holy, there's power in that command. Holiness is not gritting your teeth and trying to keep a bunch of rules. Holiness is letting the Lord help you fulfill his command. I think the devil hates holiness because it's God's command. I think also the devil hates holiness for this reason. The writer of Hebrews says, Follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. The devil knows that nobody that's unholy can go to heaven. So of course he's going to fight holiness. Of course he doesn't want you to know about holiness because if you don't have holiness in your life, you can't ever see the Lord. You can't go to heaven. Of course he fights holiness. And then we read Paul's words in 2 Corinthians. And he says, what agreement does the temple of God have with idols? Here's the news. You are the temple of God. God said, I'll dwell in them and walk in them and be their God. They'll be my people. And then here's Paul's command. Wherefore, come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing. And God says, then if you'll do that, I'll receive you. I'll be a father to you. You'll be my sons and daughters. And then Paul gives us the punchline. Having, therefore, these promises, dearly beloved, since God's given us these promises, let us take some initiative here and let's cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh. Everyone say outside and spirit. Everyone say inside. Perfecting holiness in the fear of God. So, so I think the, one of the main reasons the devil fights holiness is he knows that holiness is a fence that separates you from the things of the world. Yes. Now some people, they look down on that and they, they resent that. That holiness is a fence around apostolic people and it keeps us from the world. And they almost treat that like, well, God's trying to, to limit me and fence me in and burden me and hinder me. That's not it at all. You put things in fences that you value. Yes. If you have a little dog and you don't want it to run away, you put it on a leash or you put it in a fence. Uh, you, know, you know, how many parents do we have in the room? Would you lift your hand? Okay, you know this. Uh, if you're a parent, you've got kids in school, you don't go up and down the street in your subdivision or up and down the halls in your apartment complex hollering at everybody else's kids. Do your homework! Because you don't care if their kids do their homework. In fact, if their kids don't do their homework, it makes your kid look smarter. So it would be good if they didn't do their homework. But you say to your kid, do your homework! Because you want your child to develop uh, in education and you want them to get a good education and you want them to make something of themselves. That's not you being unkind to them. That's you blessing them, even though they don't always see it at the time. And I think one of the main reasons the devil fights holiness is that he knows that holiness is a fence that separates us from the spirit of the world because the spirit of the world constantly wars against your relationship with God. So you just mark it down right now at the onset of these two lessons that we're going to do back to back on these two nights. And I'm so glad you're here. And I'm honored to speak to you. But you mark it down. The devil hates holiness. And he fears the apostolic church. Because we're different than an average church in a whole lot of ways. We're different than an average church. You, you see, the Bible says in 1 Thessalonians 5, Paul says, And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly, W-H-O-L-L-Y, completely or fully or totally. And I pray, God, your whole spirit 
and soul and body, all three parts of you, be preserved blameless under the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Faithful is he that calleth you who also will do it. You don't have to do it on your own. God's going to help you. But here's what Paul said. I'm praying for you, Thessalonica. I'm praying that God sanctifies you in your spirit and in your soul and in your body. Your spirit is the eternal part of you that's going to live forever somewhere. Your soul, our modern word for that would be mind. It's the individual part of you, the part of you that makes you you. Your personality, your will, your intellect, your emotions, your memories, everything that makes you you is in the mind or in the soul. And so Paul said, it's not enough just to be saved in your spirit, the eternal part of you. I'm praying that God saves the individual part of you, the part of you that has memories, the part of you that has passions and lusts, the part of you that, that has uh, uh, intellect and emotion. I'm praying that God sanctifies that. And I'm praying that that holiness is so real that it shows itself on the outside. I'm praying that God sanctifies your physical part too. So whether it's eternal part, individual part, or it's your physical part, I'm praying that God sanctifies it. And here's how an apostolic church is different than any other kind of church. We know that holiness and serving God is supposed to affect every area of our lives. Amen. People say to me every once in a while, well, I've got Jesus in my heart. And I always say, well, let him out. <laughs> we can't see him in there. And the way you're living, it sure doesn't look like he's in there. That sounds like a hostage situation to me. Let him out. Amen. So Jesus doesn't want to just be in your heart. He wants to be in your priorities and in your schedule and in your media choices and in your relationship options. He wants to be in all of that. And so an apostolic church, we're not even trying to be an average church. We're striving to be an apostolic church. And in an apostolic church, what happens is we know serving God is supposed to affect every area of our life. And, and then uh, John says in uh, chapter uh, 5, verse 3 of 1 John, For this is the love of God. People say, I love Jesus. Uh -huh. Well, this is the love of God that we keep his commandments. If you say you love God, keep his commandments. Yeah, yeah. And then John adds this, and his commandments are not grievous. That's right. His commandments don't offend me. I don't get an attitude when God gives me a command. I'm just smart enough to figure out that the same reason I gave my kids rules when they were little to protect them and to bless them in the future, even if they didn't see it now, I figure that God, if he's this good, good father that we sing about all the time, then I figure that God's got enough sense to give me commandments that are going to bless me, and I trust him. And so an apostolic church, it's different than an average church because we know that loving God means loving his commandments. Don't tell me you love God if you don't love the commandments that he gives you in the word. That's what the Bible says. And, and then there's this scripture. This is Peter writing again, and he says, but you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and a holy nation of peculiar people. Now, we've tried to explain that word away to make it sound nice. And we've said, well, peculiar is rare and precious. And it is. But peculiar, can I just tell you? Peculiar is peculiar. You're supposed to stick out like a sore thumb in an ungodly, immoral, sex-crazed, perverse culture. You're supposed to stick out like a sore thumb. You are peculiar in this world. Why would God demand that we be peculiar? Well, here's why. That you should show forth the praises of him. He gets glory when you're a little different than the sinful world around you. So that's his business. You say, well, why does God have a right to demand that of me? Here's why. Because he called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. You'd still be hell bound if God hadn't brought you out of darkness into his marvelous light. So, of course, he has a right to give you a few rules. And then Paul reaches way back in the Old Testament. He said, uh, in time past, this is all images from the Old Testament. In time past, you were not a people, but now you're the people of God. In the time past, you had not obtained mercy, but now you have obtained mercy. And since God's given us all these blessings, dearly beloved, he uses a strong word here, I beg you, I beseech you, as strangers and pilgrims, stay away from, abstain from fleshly lusts. Put some distance between you and the lusts of the flesh, because those fleshly lusts war against your soul. Amen. Having your conversation, what's that mean? 
lifestyle. Having your lifestyle honest, transparent, authentic among the Gentiles. Watch this. This is incredible. That whereas right now they speak against you as evildoers. They call you names and they mock you and malign you and make fun of you. But whereas they speak against you as evildoers, they may, by your good works, which they shall behold. So it's something that shows on the outside. They will glorify God in the day of visitation. Now what's that mean? Let me jump into Peter's head for a minute and try to interpret that a little bit for us. I think in the life of every person, there comes a moment, maybe it's because they suffer a tragedy in their family. Maybe it's because they're in a time of transition. Maybe they're in a time of loss or sadness or they're struggling or there's sickness. And in that moment, they have a moment of visitation from God when for the first time in their life maybe, or for a long time, it hasn't happened, but now there's a time of visitation and they're open and tender toward God. When that happens, they're not going to go looking for somebody else that's doing drugs with them. They're not going to go looking for another alcoholic if they're struggling with alcoholism. You know what they're going to look for? They're going to look for somebody that has something different. And that's where the apostolic church needs to stop having Pentecostal panic attacks and think the world's all against us. We just need to hold steady and keep living for God because in the day of visitation, they're going to come looking for some people with some good works that they can behold. I think that day's still coming. I think God's going to give people an incredible awakening and they're going to come looking for some of you so when they come looking for you, don't you be walking toward the world. You be standing strong and living for God the same way you've always lived for God. So I think that in an apostolic church, we're different than an average church. We're not even trying to be an average church. We want to be an apostolic church. And we know that living a holy life is supposed to make us stand out in an unholy world. We're not looking for discount discipleship. We want the full deal. In an apostolic church, we don't reject holiness. We rejoice in holiness. Amen. We're not embarrassed by holiness. We wow. embrace holiness. And we don't want to underestimate the power of holiness. We want to understand the power of holiness. Now, holiness is one of the most ancient concepts and one of the most ancient words in the Bible. Uh, in the Hebrew uh, language, in the Old Testament, holiness or holy is kodesh. Uh, if you say kodesh, kodeshu, that's holy of holies. In the Greek language of the New Testament, it's hagios. That's the word holy in the Greek language of the New Testament. But whether it's Old Testament or New Testament, the word holy means literally withdrawal, separate, apart, or different. So to, to, to be holy doesn't mean that you get to define what's holy. Being holy, by definition, means to be withdrawn from the world, to be separate from the world, to be apart from the world, and to be different from the world, by definition. Now, if I get up here uh, tonight and I said, uh, yeah, we had a baptism at our church last Sunday, and uh, somebody came up, and we took a little bottle of water, and we sprinkled it on their head, we had a baptism. You wouldn't have to come up here and tackle me. Pastor would have beat you to it. He'd take the mic, he'd set me down, and he'd correct everything. And you know why? Because pastor knows that baptism has a definition. Baptizo means to plunge, to dip, to immerse, to fully cover, to put under the water. So he knows when you sprinkle somebody, that's not a baptism, biblically speaking. Well, in the same way, holiness has a definition. You can't say I'm living a holy life if you're the same as everybody in the world on your street. Holiness, by definition, means separate, apart, distinct different withdrawn from the world so don't tell me you're living a holy life if I can't tell the difference between you and the world around you now in the Old Testament they consecrated and separated holy things and holy places and holy people they anointed them they separated them the things of the tabernacle and the temple and the priesthood and they were consecrated to God now in the New Testament because we're a spiritual people with a spiritual covenant we no longer have holy things and holy places, but God still calls us to be a holy people. And in both testaments, the word holiness is a synonym for the word withdrawal, separation, apart, distinct, different, and another word that the theologians use. Holiness is exactly the same as the word sanctification in your Bible. 
To be holy is to be sanctified. So sanctification is a synonym for holiness. They mean exactly the same thing in the language of the Bible. So we're not trying to just get people to attend church. We're trying to get people to have a relationship with God. We're apostolic. We're not average. We know that real Christianity is not the decision of a moment. It is the dedication of your whole life to God being set apart. Now, Paul says to the Thessalonians, he said, uh, you want to know the will of God? How many in here want to know the will of God? Amen. Well, here's the will of God for your life. This is the will of God, even your sanctification. He said, if you want to know the will of God, here's the will of God for you. Before you pray and seek the will of God for something specific, here's the overarching principle of the will of God for you to be separate, for you to be holy, for you to be sanctified. And then he gives a specific example of sanctification, that you should abstain from fornication, sexual sin. Because every one of you needs to know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor. Everybody needs to know that. That's the will of God for you. In the very last letter Paul ever writes, the apostle is writing, this is the last time he'll ever put his pen to paper. He's going to die in the next few weeks or months. And he writes his very last letter to his son in the gospel, Timothy. Now He could write about anything. This is the last letter Paul will ever write. And here's what he writes about. He writes to Timothy about how important it is to live a holy life. How important it is to stand strong. Timothy, don't you become entangled with the world. Timothy, depart from iniquity. Timothy, flee from youthful lust. Timothy, follow after righteousness. He could be writing about anything. But the great apostle Paul, who's about to lay down his life, feels that holiness is the most important thing he can leave with the next generation. He wants Timothy to be a vessel of honor so his life can be useful. Here's Paul's words. Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal. The Lord knows them that are His. Just because you call yourself a Christian doesn't mean God thinks you're a Christian. The Lord knows them that are His. And let everyone that nameth the name of Christ, let them depart from iniquity. Amen. Timothy, in a great house... There's not just vessels, vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and earth. And this is true in the New Testament. Some vessels were fancy. They were expensive. They were used to impress company that came to the house. Other vessels were vessels not of honor, but vessels to dishonor. Some were vessels of honor, some dishonor. What's that mean? Well, there were, in that day, they didn't have indoor plumbing. There were some vessels that were used for some things that you wouldn't want them put in the same cupboard as the good vessels. And, and so... Paul said, Timothy, some people's lives are going to be lives of honor, holiness, sanctification. And some people are going to be lives of dishonor. But if a man therefore purge himself from these, what? All these things I've been writing to you about. All these sins and iniquity and lust of the flesh. If he purges himself from these, he will then be a vessel unto honor, sanctified and meet for the master's use and prepared unto every good work. And that is our desire. We're not trying to be average. We're trying to be apostolic. We want to be vessels that God can use. Vessels that God is pleased with. Vessels of honor and holiness. Now the struggle over holiness is not new. But I think it has accelerated in the last days because the devil knows his time is short. Amen. There was a German philosopher named George Hegel. And Mr. Hegel once said, quote, the only thing we learn from history is that we don't learn anything from history. That's a pretty good quote. The only thing we learn from history is we never learn anything from history. We live in an era when nearly every Christian denomination and congregation is making an attempt to accommodate our sinful culture. They're trying to make Christianity and the Bible and Jesus more palatable to sinners. Yeah. But if we look at the history of the church, we can see that that's a very dangerous idea. Amen. Here's what's happened with most denominations today. The world said, we don't like what you preach. And so they backed up a little bit and said, well, we'll move here. We'll move the lines back here. And the world just came crashing in on the new line. And then they said, oh, well, we don't want to offend you, so we'll move the line here. And, and then the world, they think that by moving the line and by uh, dumbing it down, someday the world's going to be happy with them. 
Can I tell you, a sinful world is never going to be happy with the message of Jesus who said, I am not a way, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except by me. And so the world's never going to be happy. You can change a church to try to accommodate the world, and they're going to want more accommodation. So as apostolics, we've just decided something. We've just decided that we're going to stand with the word, preach the word, believe the word, live the word. Uh, we're, we're just going to live this, and we're not going to move any lines for anybody because we didn't set the lines. Jesus set the lines in his word. Now, this battle over holiness is not new. That's right. If you go back to the Bible in Acts chapter 6, you'll find out that the apostles appointed seven deacons to, uh, to minister in the church. Nicholas, whose name there is last on the list, he was one of the first seven deacons chosen to serve the church, entrusted with a position of responsibility and leadership. But unfortunately, Nicholas' dedication to apostolic truth was very short-lived. According to early writings on heresy, Nicholas eventually backslid and he introduced something to the church in the end of the first century called the doctrine of the Nicolaitan. Now his doctrine abused Paul's doctrine of the grace of God. Nicholas introduced to his followers an idea, a false freedom. Several of the early church fathers including Irenaeus, Hippolytus, Epiphanius, and Theodore, and all mention this group. And they state that Nicholas was the author of this terrible heresy. In his writing, Against Heresies, Irenaeus lets us know how far the worldliness of this former apostolic group eventually reached. Here's what Irenaeus said, quote, the Nicolaitans are the followers of that Nicholas who was one of the seven first ordained as deacons by the apostles. They lead lives of unrestrained indulgence. End of quote. Wow. So Irenaeus is just one person who tags the Nicolaitans and says, they left everything holy. They left behind everything godly. And now they live just like the world. The doctrine of the Nicolaitans. See, what Nicholas did was he told people, you can live for Jesus on the inside, but be unaffected on the outside. He was a Greek dualist. The Greeks, they believed that flesh and spirit, they were distinct from each other, and they never met. In fact, there were some weird doctrines that grew up about Jesus, that he wasn't really uh, God in flesh. He was just a spirit, kind of an apparition. All kinds of weird doctrines grew up at the end of the first century as the apostles died off. Well, Nicholas introduces this doctrine that says you can be saved on the inside and worldly on the outside and God doesn't care. That's false teaching. It was false teaching then and it's still false teaching now. And so if you go to the book of Revelation, you find John lists the Nicolaitans beside a guy named Balaam, the doctrine of Balaam. Balaam, the Bible says in Revelation, cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel. Balaam, you remember, he was the guy that tried to hire a prophet to curse Israel. You remember this? Well, well, he tried to curse Israel from without, and God shut him down. But if you continue reading Numbers 22 through chapter 25, you'll find out that when Balaam couldn't curse Israel from without, he taught them to mix godliness and worldliness together, and they cursed themselves from within. He didn't have to do a thing. And that same spirit in the New Testament is behind the doctrine of Balaam. And it's also behind the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which is the very same thing. Nicholas taught that since Christians were sinners saved by grace, they could live like the world on the outside and serve Jesus on the inside. False doctrine then, still a false doctrine. Amen. But here's what I'd like you to notice. Look in those verses. God says through John... So hast thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. Revelation 2 verse 6, he commends another church and says, now this you have, you've got a lot of problems, but you got one thing going good, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Now in the Old Testament prophetic books, there are many times when God says, I hate something. 
But in the New Testament, there's only one thing that God says he hates. It's the doctrine and the deeds of the Nicolaitans. Jesus says the world hated him. He tells us the world's going to hate us. But the only thing in the New Testament that God says he hates is this idea that you can live for Jesus on the inside and remain unaffected on the outside. God said, I hate that doctrine. It is not okay to live a worldly lifestyle and still call yourself a Christian. God still has a problem with people who despise holiness today. Amen. Paul says... God has not called us unto uncleanness. He has called us unto holiness. You say, I don't agree with you, Pastor Raymond. Well, that's your problem because God says, He therefore that despises this message and command of holiness, He's not despising man. He's despising God because God gave you His Holy Spirit. Hey, wait a minute. Stop the bus. If we've got a Holy Spirit inside of us, don't you think that should make us live a holy life? How in the world are we so dumb that we can think, I can have the Holy Ghost in here and live unholy out here? It doesn't work. And so if you despise that, if you don't agree with that, you're not disagreeing with me. You're disagreeing with God. You're despising not man, but God. Now here's what I want you to notice, folks. It was an outward standard of holiness that the church lost at the end of the first century. That was the first thing that went. But it wasn't the last thing that went. As soon as an external standard of holiness went, it was followed by real repentance, water baptism in Jesus' name. They lost that too. They lost speaking in tongues. They lost the gifts of the Spirit. They lost the beautiful doctrine of the mighty God in Christ, the oneness of God. And you fast forward about a couple hundred years or so, and they're starting to pray to images and burn candles to the dead. And that's called the Dark Ages. You know what pushed us into the dark ages. It was first when the church lost an outward standard of holiness because of Nicholas and his followers and the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. But as soon as they lost outward holiness, they started to lose hold of everything else. Look around you today. Watch any church that once had a standard of godliness and the moment they lose it, they just stepped on a very steep and slippery slope down to oblivion spiritually. I don't care how big they get. I don't care how many numbers they have. I don't care what they talk about or how much they say they're Christian or how much they say they're holy. If they're not living in a way that distinguishes them from the world around them, they're not living it right. Only when we got into the dark ages, only when somebody looked around in shock and saw people calling themselves Christian and praying to the dead and lighting candles for the dead and praying to statues and confessing their sins to a man instead of to God and doing all kinds of pagan things in the name of Christianity. Only then did people start to say, oh my goodness. Where did we go wrong? I'll tell you where the church went wrong. It was the first thing to go at the end of the first century. It was the beautiful and powerful doctrine of holiness. When they abandoned a lifestyle of holiness, they ended up losing everything else. And to that error in church history, I stand here today and say, not here not us, not this church, not this people. We've decided we're going to live the word of God as it was written, as it was declared. We're not looking for a different way. We're not looking for a different way. When I was in Bible school, my favorite teacher, bar everybody else, my favorite teacher was... Uh, a great elder in our district named Reverend Allison Post, A.W. Post. They called him Buddy Post. He and his family had been uh, missionaries in the country of Ceylon, uh, now uh, Sri Lanka, many, many years ago. Wonderful people. His daughter, Linda, uh, is now uh, married to uh, Brother Gleason. And Linda Gleason is our international uh, ladies president in the United Pentecostal Church International. Brother Post was my favorite teacher. He was an elder by the time I got to know him. Um, Brother Post was a little bit eccentric sometimes. He had a few little different ways. But what a brilliant man. He was self-educated, self-taught. 
totally anointed. What a great teacher. And he taught me something in Bible school that has helped me so much in living for God, helped me so much in pastoring and leading people, and it helps me so much to understand how church works and how holiness operates. Here's the statement that he gave us. He said, salvation is the most elastic word in the Bible. Hmm. Kind of a unique statement. Salvation is the most elastic word in the Bible. And Brother Post, uh, he would give us little snippets. And, and a few years later, uh, when I was studying this subject, I sat down and put some of Brother Post's wisdom, distilled it into a little chart that I'd like to show you. You see, Brother Post would say, your salvation occurs in three tenses. It occurs in the past, in the present, and in the future. And salvation is an elastic word. It's so powerful, it covers every part of your living for God. And he would say, I can still remember him, I was saved, I am being saved, and I will be saved. He'd say that over and over again. Because salvation is the most elastic word in the Bible. It stretches to cover you. Now, the theologians always have a big word for simple words. So the theologians wouldn't say it so precise as Brother Post. They would say, they'd use a big theological word. They would say, I was justified, I am being sanctified, and I will be glorified. So your uh, salvation experience is in three parts, past, present, and future. Justification, sanctification, and glorification. And, and that's your salvation experience. Now, now uh, th this is really incredible. You see, I experienced the new birth when I was just 12 years old. That's well over, uh, that's approaching... Uh, my goodness, it's well over 40 years ago. Uh, when I was 12 years old, I, was, I repented of my sins. I was baptized in Jesus' name for the remission of my sins. And I received the baptism of the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in tongues. We call that the new birth experience or being born again. And when I experienced that at the age of 12, at that moment, I was saved. I was just as saved when I was 12 years old as I am tonight being 54 years old. I was just as saved back then as I am now. However, I wasn't as mature in the Lord back then as I am now. Can I just tell you something? If you're not more like Jesus this year than you were last year, you're doing this wrong. If you're not growing up in God, you know, some people, they come to church and they grow old, but they never grow up. Have you ever met? No, never. don't raise your hand. And certainly don't point. They grow old, they never grow up. They're just as cranky and carnal and moody and it's just terrible. And they've still got all the same sins and lusts and hang-ups 20 years later. Because they've never gone on to the next stage, which is sanctification. Do you know what sanctification is a synonym for? Holiness. So the middle part of living for God uh, is to make you holy. And then finally we come to the last part, which is glorification. is when you die and go to heaven or you go in the rapture of the church and you go to heaven. And so, so, so Brother Post would say, I was saved, I'm being saved, and someday I will be saved. See, back here, I was saved from the penalty of my sin. God wiped them all out. And for some of you, you weren't 12 when you came to God. You were 50, or you were 45, or you were 39. And when you came to God, you had a long list of sins. You had a long list of bad decisions and wrong turns and terrible mess-ups and hang-ups and habits and just all kinds of junk in your life. But when you came to God, here's what's so great about salvation. He literally washed away your sins. And He gave you a brand new track record. It's amazing. And you were saved from the penalty of your sin. He ripped up all the list of your sins. And you were saved from the penalty of your sins. You were justified. But now, every day that you live, God moves you now into a different process. And now that you're saved, he moves you into this process called sanctification. And you're every day being made holy, being made more like Jesus. And in this stage, it's not that you're saved from the penalty of your sin. Now you're being saved from the power of sin over you. And the longer you live for Jesus the more there should be a separation between you and the old life you used to live. Amen. I, I can set my watch by it almost. New converts, new believers, they come into the church, they become part of our church family, and, and, and usually it's about four to six weeks in. You can almost set your clock by it. Okay, here they come, and you know what they're coming for. Uh, 
This guy named Alan was one, one of them. He, he comes into the office. He's just weeping profusely. Great guy. Just love him. He comes in. He's just crying. Oh, pastor, pastor, I can't do this. I'm a failure. I'm a sinner. I can't do what you guys do. I'm quitting church. I can't do this, pastor. And I just said, whoa, 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 Alan. Just hang on. Tell me what happened. I'm thinking, I know what's coming. He said, Pastor, you know I work, and, and, and you know I got this job, and you know I use tools. And Pastor, I was up on a ladder today. He's just crying. And I had a hammer, Pastor. And I was holding a nail, Pastor. And I just, Pastor, I just, I hit my thumb, Pastor. And I cursed. He just, like, he's a puddle of tears. Carpet's getting wet. He's crying. Pastor, I can't do this. I'm a failure. I can't live for God. I'm no good. I'm just going to quit church. I can't do this. I said, just before you leave church forever, Alan, can I ask you a question? I said, um, last year, um, when you hit your thumb with a hammer on the job, um, did it upset you like this? He just looks at me. He's still crying. He goes, no. He said, Alan, you know what that means? I said, that means that you do have salvation inside of you, and the Holy Ghost is inside of you, and today is not your nature anymore. It's a mistake. It's a sin. It's a failure. And so all you have to do is repent, let Jesus make you more like him and forgive you, and you just keep on going. Because a year ago, it wouldn't have bothered you. He said, you're right. He said, a year ago, I cursed every word. I said, see? A year ago, before you were saved, but now God's making you into his image. You can almost set your clock like it. Every one of you, if you've lived for God for any length of time, you've had one of those dark days or dark nights of the soul, and you messed up, and you made a mistake. Isn't it a wonderful privilege to be able to come to God and say, God, I need you to, to just renew the power of the Holy Ghost in me because I'm not the person I was before I got here. That's called sanctification. That's being made more like Jesus. See, Alan was more like Jesus than he had been a year ago. And that's why it upset him and grieved him so bad. That's called sanctification. And, and, and so I was saved. I was saved from the penalty of my sin. I'm being saved every day. I'm being saved from the power of sin under me. But can I tell you something great? One day very soon, Jesus is returning. And when he comes back, I will be saved. And if you're in the church, you will be saved. And we will experience what the theologians call glorification. Do you know what that means? That means we will be saved forever out of the very presence of sin. No more temptation. No more devil. No more trouble. No more trials. No more. It's, it's over forever. We had an old elder in our church. His name was Albert McCoy. And Brother McCoy got sick with cancer. He got very, very feeble. And this great big hulk of a man, uh, his body became so frail. He had a large family. And in, in the last uh, week of his life, they, they started calling all the children in this large, large family. And, and they're all in the hospital room. And at this point, he hasn't responded to anybody in any way for two or three, four days. And the family's all gathered around, the daughters and the sons. And all of a sudden, uh, um, he, he just uh, he comes out of it uh, I, and, and he, he wakes up and he says he doesn't say it he, he just starts uh, wanting to sit up and his daughters go over and they say dad you, you know you gotta, you gotta lay back down this is gonna hurt you dad uh, you, you don't have any strength to sit up his little emaciated body but he's making it very obvious through his grunts and pointing and swinging his arms he hasn't responded to anybody for three or four days. He sits up. They get him on the side of the bed, and they get his poor little thin little legs over the side of the hospital bed, and they're steadying him there. And, and they told us he just looked off into space. He wasn't looking at any of them. He wasn't looking at anybody in particular. And all of a sudden, that voice that they hadn't heard for three or four days, Brother McCoy said, Devil, you can't get me now. Laid back down, and a couple hours later, he was gone. There's coming a day when we're going to be out of the reach of hell, sin, the devil, death, and bondage, and addiction, and pain, and temptation. 
That's what God's talking about when he said, someday I'm coming back. Someday I'm going to redeem you unto myself. And when we see him, we shall be like him. We're going to see him as he is. We're going to be glorified. That's the end of your salvation. You are not wasting your time living for Jesus. There's a great day coming when we're free from all of this world and all this trouble and all this mess. So salvation is the most elastic word in the Bible. I was saved. I'm being saved. And bless God, someday I will be saved. Now, you know where we're all living? Unless you just died a second ago. We're all living in this middle part. We've been saved, but we haven't been glorified yet. And we're all still living in this middle part. Meaning that that's the biggest part of your life here on earth. Is being made holy. Being made sanctified. You've already experienced the new birth. If that was all there is, we would have held you under when we baptized you and let you go to Jesus. <laughs> but the reason you're still breathing and you're still here is because there's more growing for you to do. And God wants to make you into his image right here on earth so you can be a witness and a testimony to everybody else. That's called holiness or sanctification. And it's incredible and we are blessed to have it so so that's where we are living and it's god's will so holiness is not an add-on or an option for the christian life holiness is the point of the christian life Amen. to be made into his image now people say have you ever noticed that people say dumb things yeah. no no not in texas okay uh -oh, okay is there anybody here, maybe you're from Canada and you're just visiting with us tonight and you know somebody that says dumb things. Is there anybody? Help me out here. I'm dying up here. Okay, okay. So we've got five people that have ever heard somebody say a dumb thing. Okay, good. Glad the rest of you live in your little perfect world. When you wake up, come talk to us, okay? Because you hear people say dumb things. Here's one of the dumb things people say in church. Well, God loves you just the way you are. You know, that's true, but it's very incomplete. Yes, God loves you just the way you are, and he loves you way too much to leave you that way. That's right. God loves you just the way you are, but if you think he's going to let you call yourself a Christian for 50 years while you still do all the sins you did when you were a pagan, you got another thought coming. God does love you just the way you are, but that's an incomplete sentence. He wants to change you. Now, now... Um, just let me grab something. I just, sorry. I should have had this out. Anybody know, um, anybody know what this is? Yeah. <laughs> I know you've never seen one of these probably in Texas. <laughs> this is an iPhone. And this is my iPhone. And on this iPhone, it's the neatest thing. I have these little icons. Anybody ever seen an icon? Yeah. 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 And, and, and icons are really, really neat. Uh, because when you press an icon, um, it takes you into a program, an app. It's really neat. And so uh, when I want the calendar icon, I press on the little button that looks like a calendar. And lo and behold, the calendar pops up. When I want to check my email, I don't push on the calendar button. I push on the email button. Um, w when I want music, I don't push on the email button. I push on the music icon. I know that's hard to understand. Are we, are we struggling with that? Everybody got that? You understand? Okay, so, so let me show you something cool in the Bible. Um, Colossians chapter 3. Lie not to one another. You've put off that old man with his deeds. And you've put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image. Everyone say image. image. Of him that created him. Romans 8, 29. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image. Everyone say image. image. Of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15. Um, and as we have borne the image, everyone say image, image. of the earthy, now we also bear the image, image of the heavenly. Now this I say, brethren, flesh and blood can't inherit the kingdom of God, neither can corruption inherit incorruption. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, now the Lord is that spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all, with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image, image from glory to glory, even as by the spirit of the Lord. Now, the word image that's translated there into English is the Greek word ikone, which is where we get our English word icon. So, so here's what uh, Paul is teaching us in all of that, those scriptures. He's saying that 
You are an icon of the holy. You are an icon of the new man. You are an icon of God's spirit in you. And so when I push on the calendar button, the calendar pops up. I don't push on the calendar button if I want something else. Meaning that for an icon, the whole purpose of an icon is that you know what's inside by how it looks on the outside. Yes. Come on. Come on. And you are an icon of the heavenly. You are an icon of the holy. You are an icon of the new man, the new creature. And so your outside has to reflect that for you to fulfill any of those scriptures. The point of the Christian life is that as you grow, you begin to think and talk and act and react like Jesus would. And as you grow in God, your old nature is subdued by the new nature that you received when you were born again. Uh, a, a Christian writer named C.S. Lewis said this, quote, When I invited Jesus into my life, I thought he was going to put up some wallpaper and hang a few pictures. But he started knocking out walls and adding on rooms. I said to Jesus, I was expecting a nice little cottage. And Jesus said, no, I'm making a palace in which to live. You see, you know what you are? You are a lifelong renovation project of the Holy Ghost. Your entire life, as long as you've got breath in your body, if you're an apostolic Christian, the purpose of you being here is to be made into the image of Jesus Christ. Now that battle is not won in your spirit. Your spirit's already full of the Holy Ghost. That battle is not even won out here in the physical with your five senses. That battle is won or lost in your mind. Because your mind or your soul is the connection between the inside of you, the spirit, the Holy Ghost, and the outside world around you. And that's why you start to read things like this in the New Testament. Romans 12, I beg you, I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, present your body, the outside part, the part everybody sees, the part that interacts with the world. Present your bodies a living sacrifice. Holy, acceptable unto God. And you don't get extra points for that. That's just your reasonable service. You know what the problem is with living sacrifices? In the Old Testament, you slit the throat of the animal, you shed its blood, you put the carcass on the altar, and it stays there. You know what the problem with the living sacrifice is? We keep getting down off the altar. And every day, Paul said, you got to take yourself back to the altar. You're not a dead sacrifice. You're a living sacrifice. You've got to take yourself back to the altar every day and put yourself on the altar every day. And be not conformed to this world. Everybody say conformed. That's the world's process. That Greek word means to be pushed into a mold. And that's why we have this... Uh, schizophrenia in our culture where people say, I'm an individual. I do my own thing. I call the shots. And yet they're scared to death. They have to wear the same tennis shoes as everybody else, the same uh, jeans, the, the same sunglasses, carry the same uh, technology because they're scared to death of being different. Apostolics are not scared to death of being different because we've been called to be different. So don't be pushed into the world's mold, Paul says, but be transformed. Everybody say transformed. See, being conformed, pushed, and forced, that's the world's process to get you to change. But being transformed, that's God's process to get you to change. And transformed is the same root as uh, metamorpho, where we get the word metamorphosis. It, it, it's that whole process by which a, a, a caterpillar spins a cocoon around itself. <laughs> and, and, and it uh, goes into that cocoon for a time, and then it emerges a different creature entirely. And Paul said, that's God's process. God doesn't try to get you to conform to the rules. He, he wants to transform your life. So be transformed. Where does that happen? By the renewing of your mind. The mind is the battleground. With your mind, you're either going to choose to submit to God's commandments or you're going to choose to rebel against God's commandments. It's all happening in your mind. Look at what he says in 1 Corinthians. Don't you know you're the temple of God? The Spirit of God dwells in you. And if any man defiles the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God, it's a holy temple. Which temple you are? You're the temple. Now, I'm going to give you probably the most important thing 
I will say tonight. And tonight we are talking about principles of holiness. And here's why. There's no sense of talking about the specifics of holiness if you don't even understand the principles of holiness. Because then you only, you do the world's process. You conform to the rules of the church just because you want to belong. Nowhere in the Bible does it tell us to make people conform to a list of rules. What we're after is not you conforming to the rules so pastor will stay off your back. That's way too low a goal for us. No, here's what we're after. We're after the Holy Ghost getting in your life and the Holy Ghost becoming your teacher and the Holy Spirit in you teaching you to live a holy life and you don't obey out of force or compulsion. You obey out of joy and you obey out of privilege. That's what we're after. So I'm about to say probably the most important thing I will say tonight because holiness is about this middle process. It's about growth. It's about you growing up in the family of God. And for that reason, most of the holiness standards that we talk about, most of the uh, lifestyle convictions that we preach, we've got to remember, they are not in and of themselves salvation issues. You are never going to be saved by what you wear or don't wear. Right. Yeah. That is not a salvation issue in and of itself. So if holiness issues are not salvation issues, then what are they? This is pretty obvious from the word of God that they're important. So if they're not salvation issues, then what are these holiness standards that we teach and preach? They are sanctification issues. That's why the first people in the door, when you first come to church, we don't give you a dress code so you can come here. That would be crazy. You're still a sinner at that point. You have no relationship with God. What good would it do you as a sinner to start dressing like an apostolic Pentecostal when you don't even have a relationship with God yet? So we want to put first things first. We want you to experience salvation first. Yeah. And then once you've experienced salvation, now you have the Holy Ghost inside of you to help you with the next step, which is starting to live a holy life. And that's why holiness standards, holiness convictions, they're not salvation issues in and of themselves. They are what we would call maturity issues. Now, now just because something's not a salvation issue doesn't mean it's not an important issue. Right. Here, here's what you got to understand. When my son Matthew was two years old, not one time did I ever ask him, buddy, take out the trash. <laughs> because in the Woodward household, the trash bag at that point was taller than Matthew was and heavier. But when Matt was 16 and still living at home, and I said, hey, bud, take out the trash. If he gave me some attitude or made it very clear he wasn't going to do what I asked him to do, then I would throw at him a statement from your great state. Houston, we have a problem. <laughs> now, did I love Matthew less when he was 16 than I did when he was two? Yeah. Nope. In fact, I loved him more. He'd been part of my life for 14 additional years. But I expected more of him yeah. because he was maturing. Yeah. And that is why your pastor and every good pastor... They, they use a lot of compassion and patience and love and long-suffering with new babies in the Lord. They don't give them a list of rules first Sunday they come here. They let them know the Lord and experience salvation and start to grow. That's right. But that same pastor, as you get older in the Lord, he's going to tell you, if you want to sing in the choir, you got to live this way. If you're an apostolic and you want to be involved, you want to be a teacher in the church, then you got to live this way. You say, Pastor doesn't love me anymore. Yes, he does. He loves you more. Yeah. He's asking you to grow. See, if, if Matt was 16 and we were still diapering him and bottle feeding him and, and still having to do everything for him and he wasn't walking and he wasn't talking, 
we would know there was a serious mental or, or physical problem with him, and we would feel so badly, like we do for anybody who has a child in that state. It, it's a, a, a terrible thing that they have to live through, and those parents need your prayers and your love because they have a, a huge responsibility all their life that those of us who raise children who are healthy, we don't have that after a certain point. And, and, and in the family of God, if somebody's not growing, can I just tell you, there's a problem. If you're not adopting a holiness lifestyle over time as you grow, there's a problem with your maturity and your development. And, 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 and this, is, this is a tragedy for people. And not only is it a tragedy, it's very dangerous. Because the Bible says, to him that knows to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. People say, well, Okay, I'm off the hook. Whew. Pastor Raymond said, holiness standards are not salvation issues. Correct. But if you know to do them, if you've grown up and you know that it's in the Bible and you've heard pastor teach it and you've seen the saints do it and you know it's there and you just say, oh, I'm just a baby. I'm going to be a baby for the next 50 years. So I'll never have to do that. See, you just crossed the line because now you know what you're doing. And James said, to him that knows to do good and does it not. It's not just a little maturity issue anymore. It is sin. And sin is a salvation issue. So holiness standards are not in and of themselves a holiness, a salvation issue. But they can become a salvation issue if you rebel once you're taught and you know that God requires it. Now, let, let, let me uh, head here for a moment and... Uh, I told the team the other uh, evening, uh, Friday evening, when we, I guess that was last night. Uh, wow, <laughs> time really flies when you're having fun. Uh, last night I told them, you know, uh, we're coming in for a landing, but we're just not sure where the airport is. But we're getting there, okay? So, so we'll land this sermon in just a little bit. Um, God's family is not a dysfunctional family. That's right. It's a normal, loving, healthy family. It would be a tragedy in your family if your children never matured and never grew up, never developed. It's a tragedy in the family of God when God's kids never grow up, never mature, and never develop. You see, there's something precious about you in this church that are the mature saints in the church. There, there's now, now, can we try this question again? Because I didn't do very good the first time. Has anybody ever heard anybody say something dumb? Yeah. Oh, finally. Where were you people earlier? <laughs> Okay, here's something dumb that people say. And it sounds so spiritual. People say it all the time. Don't follow me. Follow Jesus. Doesn't that sound spiritual? They say, don't look at me. Don't look at me. Look at Jesus. That sounds so spiritual. You know, most of the time, the people that say that, they're hiding something they don't want you to see. That's why they don't want you looking at them. It sounds so spiritual, and yet the New Testament is totally different. Paul says, I beseech you, be followers of me. Yes. Be followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. Yes. Brethren, be followers together of me, and you can mark everybody else that's walking like me and use us all for an example. Right. Timothy, don't let anybody despise thy youth, but you be an example of the believers in word, conversation, charity, spirit, faith, purity. Can I say something to the elder, mature members of the church? Those that have been here for a little while, it is your job to be an example of the believers. Amen. It is your job to be an example that new babies in Christ can follow. Where are they going to learn to worship if they never see you worship? Where are they going to learn to give if they never see you give? Where are they going to learn? This is going to hurt you, this one. Where are they going to learn that they need to get themselves in the altar every service if they never see you budge out of your seat to go to the altar? Where are they going to learn to lift their hands and praise God out loud? Where are they going to learn that if you don't do it because you are a mature believer, you're an example of the believers, and they're supposed to be able to look at you and follow you. That's your job. And, and, and so uh, this is why pastor has patience with new converts, and he uses all kinds of patience, and we allow people to grow. But by the same token, we do want you to grow because it's the will of God for you to grow. And remember that although most issues of holiness are maturity issues, they're not salvation issues. If you continually reject God's commands, 
You fall under what James said. You know to do good, and you don't do it, and it's sin. And in fact, uh, the writer of Hebrews, he says in chapter 10, let's consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. Don't provoke people to anger. Don't provoke people with your words, but provoke them to good works. And then he says, don't forsake the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is. Why does he say that connected together? Because you've got your best chance to survive living for God when you get your carcass in church as often as you can. There's something about being around people that are living for God and going the same direction. There's just something about that. You know what makes people, if you, were, if you remember when you were a new believer, you came in here and you looked all around and you thought, I can never do this. I can never live like those people. You know what? You were exactly right. You can't live like those people. But the Holy Ghost in you can help you live like those people. And that's why it's important for you to marinate in the presence of God every chance you get. And when we get to church, you jump in and you participate with everybody else. And, and, and the writer of Hebrews says, uh, exhort one another. So much the more. Do this more as you see the coming of the Lord approaching. For if we sin willfully... If you know to do good and you don't do it, if we sin willfully after we've received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. Does that mean Calvary shuts down and Jesus' blood doesn't work? No. It means that you don't want it anymore because you're sinning willfully. You know what to do good what to do that is good and you won't do it and so you're walking away from God. You're walking back toward the world. It's very important to live for God. Now, I, I am coming to a close in the next few moments, but I, I, I just want to leave you with this because some of you have been attacked over the way you live by other Christians. So let me help you with something because religious people talk about being saved by grace as though being saved by grace was somehow an excuse to allow them to continue to live like the world. But grace, hear me well, Grace is not an excuse. Grace is enabling power. Grace is the power of God to lift you up and allow you to live a holy life. Let me give you a test. Old Testament. The Bible says, don't kill anybody. Jesus comes along. The New Testament. The covenant of grace. We're now going to be under grace. You know what he says? You heard it said, don't kill anybody. I say, if you hate somebody in your heart, you got murder in your heart. You're in just as much trouble as if you shot a gun or lifted a knife. Amen. Can I ask you a question? Which is a higher, harder standard to keep? Old Testament law or New Testament grace? Grace is a higher standard than law. Let me give you one more example. The Old Testament says, don't commit adultery. Jesus comes along and says, you heard it said. Don't commit adultery. I tell you, if you even look on somebody and lust after them, you've committed adultery not in the hotel room. You've committed adultery in your heart. Yeah. Can I ask you a question? Which is a higher, harder law to live? Old Testament law or New Testament grace? So all these people that are saying, I'm saved by grace, they don't understand what they're talking about when they're using that as an excuse to continue in sin. Grace is a higher law than law. Yeah. Now the bad news is, we already messed up in the Old Testament. We couldn't keep any of God's law. You could write one word over the whole Old Testament. It would have to be the word, word failure. We failed. No matter how many temples, days, or sacrifices, or feast days, or priesthoods they had. No matter how much they did, they could never measure up. And so we failed. And then Jesus comes along and raises the law 150%. Now we don't have a hope at all. Except... Uh -huh. If we can get the Holy Ghost inside of us, because then the Holy Ghost, by His grace, lifts you up from that old way of living and lets you live for God a holy life. And, and, and people get messed up. Let, let me give you a couple of scriptures, because people say this to me. And usually when they say these scriptures to me, they have their face all screwed up in that, like, holy look. Okay, so here they are. Eva Ephesians. 2 verse 8. For by grace, they come to me. Pastor Raymond, you need to see this scripture. I don't agree with what you're preaching. For by grace are you saved through faith. And it's not of yourselves. It's a gift of God. Not of works. They usually holler that part. Lest any man should boast. You see there, Pastor Raymond? What do you think of that, Pastor Raymond? I'm not saved by works. I'm saved by grace. So I'm going to spend the rest of my life sitting here in my hammock, sipping lemonade, waiting for Jesus to come back. And I'm just as saved as you are because I'm saved by grace, not by works. What do you think of that? It's usually about the spirit they talk in. And I always answer them exactly the same I have for 30-some years of ministry. I, I always say, just as kind as I can be. 
Read the next verse. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. So, I agree with you. I'm not saved by my works. When I was a sinner, I couldn't do enough good works if I lived for a thousand years to merit salvation. But now that I am a Christian, God lined up a whole lifetime of good works, which he has before ordained that I should walk in them. Titus, he, he says uh, in his writing, he said, we're not saved by works of righteousness. It's true. He makes the point. But if you continue reading on the, the, the very last phrases, he says, but they which have believed in God, they should be careful to maintain good works. Titus, what are you talking about? You just said we're not saved by works, and now you said we, may, we should be careful to maintain good works. What are you talking about, Titus? Here's what I'm talking about. I'm agreeing with Paul that before you're saved, you couldn't do enough good works to get saved. But now that you are saved, you need to be careful to maintain good works. And, and, and James gets into this and he talks about it. He said, your faith, if it doesn't have any works, it's dead faith. He said, uh, you choose to show me your faith without works. I'm going to choose to show you my faith by my works. Don't you realize, oh vain man, faith without works is dead. He says in, in chapter 2, he says, uh, by works a man is justified. It's not by faith only. He says in chapter 2, just like your body, if you didn't have your spirit would be dead. Faith without works, that's dead also. And Jesus said this. Matthew 5, 16. Let your light so shine before men. They got to see it. That they, and what is your light? Well, it's my kind, gentle demeanor. No, it's not. That they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. You ever notice that in Revelation 2, 3 to the seven churches of Asia Minor, every church, God says, I know your works. He judges them based on their works. It's, it's, it's unreal. Um, I want to just show you this, and then I'm going to close. That's how many times have I said that? Five? <laughs> don't, don't give me that attitude, though, because pastors done that, too. Now, now, I want you to look at this little chart just for a second. We're not going to spend long here. Um, you have three holiness teachers in your life. Three of them. Not one of them. You have three. And your three holiness teachers are, first of all, the Bible. And then your second holiness teacher is your spiritual leadership. And your third holiness teacher is your Holy Ghost inside of you. The Bible gives us what we call Bible standards. If the Bible says, thou shalt not, guess what we do? We shalt not. <laughs> but the Bible doesn't talk about everything that we face in the 21st century. There is no verse in the Bible that says, Thou shalt not look at pornography on the internet. If you ever find that verse, let me know, because I'll preach the fire out of that. We're being <laughs> slaughtered out there. Now, now, there's no verse that says that. However, the Bible is filled with principles. The Bible says, I will set no evil thing before mine eyes. I've made a covenant with my eyes. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. Uh, whatsoever things are good and pure, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. So there's lots of principles. So every once in a while, your spiritual leadership will go to prayer and he'll get with the Lord and he'll come out of a prayer meeting and he'll come to this pulpit and he'll say, folks, here's how we need to deal with the Internet. Here's how we need to deal with this issue. Here's how we need to deal with because the Bible didn't talk about the Internet. The Bible didn't talk about many modern issues that we face today. It didn't talk about them. Well, there was one Canadian preacher years ago who didn't like the Internet. And he wrote a gospel track. He took his text from Matthew. They left their nets and followed him. <laughs> I think he was a tiny bit out of context. Uh, but, but anyway, that being as it, as it may be. There's lots of principles that pastor can study and preach from to tell us how to deal with something that's killing as many people spiritually as the internet. And then finally, you have the Holy Ghost inside of you. And he's your third holiness teacher. See, Bible standards, they're just a, a plain word from God. But pastor, our spiritual leadership, he gives us what we would call church standards. And church standards vary sometimes from culture to culture, continent to continent, country to country, even church to church. Because pastor is commissioned by God to, to, to look at what's facing this congregation. And if he's your spiritual leadership, you are supposed to submit to him. In fact, Paul says to the Corinthians, he said, this speak I, not the Lord. 
But I expect you to do it because I'm the apostle here. Uh, Paul says in another place, I'm speaking this by permission, not of commandment. Jesus didn't tell me I had to say this, but I've looked at it, and here's what we need to do, and I'm speaking it by his permission, not because it's a thou shalt not. And those are church standards, and you are just as responsible to live those church standards in God's eyes as you are to live Bible standards. And finally, the Holy Ghost is your third holiness teacher. And, and the Holy Ghost will talk to you individually. And, and the Holy Ghost sometimes will say, uh-uh, uh-uh. Don't go there. You know what happened last time you went there. You've got to learn to hone your spiritual senses to listen to the Holy Ghost in you. And the Holy Ghost gives you standards. They're, they're implemented personally in your life. And, and if the Holy Ghost gives you a standard, you can have a standard about everything, by the way. If you want to have a standard against fresh air, knock yourself out. <laughs> Years ago in New Brunswick, Canada, uh, these two old guys were talking at a convention, and one of them walked up the other. He was a real legalist. He, he said, I see you wear deodorant. <laughs> Apparently he had a conviction against deodorant. And if you want to have that conviction, knock yourself out. But don't knock me out. Don't sit beside me, okay? <laughs> the other guy had a perfect answer, though. He looked back at him. He said, I see you don't wear deodorant. <laughs> so you can have any kind of personal conviction, but let me be serious for a moment. You know what personal convictions look like? I pastor some people who have a personal conviction against going to a restaurant where there's an open bar. They will not go. Doesn't matter if it's an Applebee's or whatever, they will not go. Now, I don't have that conviction. I've never had a drink of alcohol in my life. I could lay on the open bar and you could pour alcohol on me all night long and I wouldn't be tempted. I've never had a drink of alcohol. But I pastor some people that it was a place like that where they first cheated on their spouse or it was a place like that where they first took that first couple of drinks and then they became an alcoholic. It was a place like that where they hooked up with all kinds of sin and they have not a church standard, not a Bible standard. The Bible doesn't say you can't go there, but they have a personal standard. Do you think I look down at those people and say, you're so immature? No, I honor those people that they would be wanting to serve God and wanting to stay away from sin so much that they would inconvenience themselves personally to live for God a holy and godly life. I honor those people. And let me tell you how this works. See, here's the Grand Canyon. And, and there's a fence here. And this fence is called a Bible standard. If I go past that fence, I've fallen into danger. I've fallen into destruction. I've fallen into sin. So I can't go by the fence of a Bible standard. That's the fence. But do you know what a church standard is? It's where pastor looks at a modern, contemporary issue that we're facing that the Bible doesn't talk about. And he said, you know what I think we're going to do? We're going to back up a few paces, and we're going to put another fence. And, and the Bible doesn't say this, but we're going to put this fence here because we don't ever want to get even close to going past that fence. And so a church standard is a fence that's a little higher than a Bible standard because the Bible didn't talk about it. And then, you know where a personal standard goes? Some people, they're so dumb, they think, pa pastor teaches this and the Bible says this, but I don't agree. I'm going to put my personal standard down here. That's crazy. Do you know where a personal standard belongs? If this is the Bible standard, and this is the church standard pastor teaches for, for holiness. Then a personal standard, it goes back here. It's where the Holy Ghost puts an extra requirement on you that he does on anybody else. And you know why he does that? Not because he wants to hurt you or burden you, but because he loves you so much, he doesn't ever want you to go back into that life of sin that you used to come from. I don't know about you, but I've got my ear tuned to the Holy Ghost. And every once in a while, the Holy Ghost will say, Raymond, I know you. I know where you came from. I know what snared you up and tripped you up. So although pastor didn't teach it, and although the Bible doesn't require it, require it, the Holy Ghost will say to me, don't you go there. Don't you hang out with those people. Don't you go near that website. Don't you do that. Because the Holy Ghost wants to protect me from failing God. And that is a personal standard. You don't have one kind of holiness standard. You have three kinds holiness standards, and you need to pay attention to all of them. Last scripture tonight is this one. Give unto the Lord the glory do His name, the psalmist said. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Hallelujah. Holiness is not bondage. That's right. Holiness is beauty. Right. Holiness is not some kind of pathetic living. 
Holiness is powerful living. So worship the Lord in the beauty of our holiness. I close with a story tonight. It won't take very long. Precious little lady named Alicia. She came to our church. She had been a party girl when she was out in the world. There's no way of knowing or telling. Probably she can't even remember when she was in college and around the university. How many guys probably took advantage of her. How messed up she was. First heard from her when she called our church and she said, is this Pastor Raymond? And I said, yes. She said, my name is Alicia, and I um, come from a family who are atheists. They don't believe in God at all. And I've started sneaking out. They didn't care when I was a party girl at college. They didn't care when I was staying out all night with who knows who doing who knows what. They didn't care. But when I started wanting to go to church at this denominational church in your town, my parents have persecuted me. I have to sneak out of the house and tell them I'm going somewhere else to a friend's house, and I go to the friend's house, and then we go to church. She said, but I've been watching your church online, and here's what I've noticed, Pastor Raymond. I've noticed that your church is um, a little livelier than our church. I said, well, yeah, that's probably true. She said, would you mind if I came to your church? And I said, we'd be delighted to have you. And that precious young lady, she came to our church, and... Uh, she had a wonderful experience with God. She got baptized in Jesus' name, filled with the Holy Ghost, on the front row, just bouncing up and down, worshiping God. It was wonderful to see. She's a smart girl. Uh, she, she, she lives at, like, supersonic speed. She talks at supersonic speed. Uh, when she gets excited, she, she, she just... If, if you're a parent and you've ever re read your uh, children, Winnie the Pooh, she's Tigger. She bounces all over everything. <laughs> And so one day, uh, she's probably been there for maybe three months or something, but she's a smart young lady. She's very perceptive. She comes bouncing into my office. Pastor Raymond, Pastor Raymond, I got a question. Can I ask you a question? I said, sure. She said, um, I've just been looking around here since I've been here. I, I, I love this church. I, I want to be part of this church, and, and this is my church. And, and, but I've been looking around, and I noticed that all the ladies here wear skirts. And Pastor Raymond, i got a question. Do I have to wear a skirt? Because if I have to wear a skirt, I want to wear a skirt. But if I don't have to wear a skirt, I don't want to wear a skirt because I've never worn a skirt. I don't own a skirt, and, and I don't really want to wear a skirt, and, and I don't know what I do in a skirt. And, and Pastor Raymond, do I have to wear a skirt? <laughs> and I answered her the same way I would answer any young lady who asked me that question. I said, no, Alicia, you don't have to wear a skirt to come to church. But here's some scriptures. Why don't you go read these scriptures? And here's a few notes that explain these scriptures. Why don't you go read this? And when Jesus talks to you about doing this, like all the other people you see, then you come on back. It probably wasn't even a month, maybe about three weeks. She comes bouncing in the office. Pastor Raymond, Pastor Raymond, notice anything? I said, new glasses? No. I said, new hairstyle? No. I said, I said, oh, Alicia, you've got a skirt on, isn't that? She said, yes, and I am going to write a book called Skirt Adventures. Pastor Raymond, did you know that you cannot run upstairs wearing a full skirt? I said, well, no, I never really thought about it. <laughs> She said, and Pastor Raymond, did you know that when you wear a full skirt, you have to be very careful closing your car door? She said, <laughs> But don't worry, Pastor Raymond, although I tore the whole side out of my new skirt, I had duct tape, Pastor Raymond, and I was modest. I fixed it all up before I went to class. Just a precious young lady. When she left the office that day, she bounced on out, went into a youth service or a, a, a Bible study. I can't remember what, what service it was. And after she went out, I sat there just me and Jesus, and I said out loud to Jesus, I said, no. that's the way it's supposed to be. That you don't do it because you're pressured or forced. That you don't just do it because you want to belong to the Pentecostal club. But you get it, that it is the beauty of holiness. Amen. And that God invites you to a life of holiness. And you do it because you want to do it. See, new Christians often ask, do I have to? And then as they mature a little bit, they start to say, not do I have to. They start to say, I want to. Yes. 
But you get a really mature Christian that sold themselves out to Jesus, and you know what they say? I get to do this. Hallelujah. It's a privilege to live a holy life. If God saved me from a devil's hell, this is not a burden. I'm worshiping the Lord in the beauty of holiness. I wish you'd stand right now in this sanctuary, and I wish you would thank God for the beauty and the power of holiness. I, I wish you would just worship Him and give Him thanks and give Him praise and give Him honor. I, I, I wish you'd lift your voice higher than those hands and, and just thank We give him an ovation of praise and thanksgiving that he has chosen us. Hallelujah. He has chosen us. You didn't choose him. He chose you to represent him upon this earth. What a privilege that is. Amen. That holiness is not something to fear or to dread, but it's something to celebrate that the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords would thank enough of me to choose me to represent Him upon this. For you are a chosen generation, a royal priest, a holy nation, a peculiar people. Amen. And I'm so excited that He has chosen me to represent Him upon this earth. Amen. I want to be a good representation of Jesus Christ. Is that your desire? Amen. Do you have a song in mind? Praise God. That we can close with a song. Praise God. Sing it. Praise the Lord. Take me in to your presence. Take me into your presence. Take me in by the blood. Of the Lamb, take me in to your presence. Oh, hallelujah. Pass the words, touch my lips, here I am. Why don't we just kind of come toward the front a little bit? Let's just worship Him just a little bit more. Could you just come up here and just... We're just going to close. We're going to close in just a few minutes.
represent you, Lord. I want this church to represent you. In the name of Jesus Christ, I want this church to be a representation of your holiness. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, give strength to every lady. Give strength to every man. Give strength to every young person here tonight. Oh, that we get to represent Jesus Christ upon this earth. Clap your hands up right now and let's glorify the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.